Hi everyone and welcome to this week's Crime and Punishment story. Before we begin, can I just say if you enjoy this story, please do give it a thumbs up and if you haven't already done so, then please do consider subscribing to the channel if you'd like to hear more stories like this one or stories about the history of the North East. Also, please feel free to share this video if you think others might enjoy it too. Thank you. Elizabeth Pearson was found guilty of the murder of James Watson in 1875 in Gainford near Darlington. James was her uncle and it was said that she had poisoned him. Was she really guilty? I will let you decide. This is her story. Elizabeth was born Elizabeth Sedgwick in around 1847 in the village of Newsham. There are no details of who her parents were and from the age of 15 months old she was living with her aunt Jane in the neighbouring village of Gainford. I have searched but been unable to find any other details about Elizabeth's early life or any reason for her to be living with her aunt. At the time of her trial it is stated that her mother is still alive but it was not unheard of for a family member to look after some of the children if the parents had too many or were not able to cope so this may have been the case here. In around 1867 she had married John Pearson and it was said that they had four children together. However, I was only able to find confirmed evidence of one child, a daughter. James Watson, the victim, was the husband of Elizabeth's Aunt Jane. He had been previously widowed and Jane was his second wife. It was said that Elizabeth and James got on well together and that he was very fond of her. Prior to her marriage to John Pearson, Elizabeth had lived in the home of her aunt and uncle. Jane and James Watson lived in Church Row in Gainford, which was a street that ran along from St Mary's Church. Church Row is still there today, but it would appear to have a different name now, and I am not sure if the entire street is there or just part of it. Elizabeth's Aunt Jane died, according to some newspaper reports, between 12 and 15 months prior to the crime being committed. James had then taken in a lodger by the name of George Smith. It was said he did this, as was quite common at the time, to help him to be able to pay the costs for the house in Church Row, as he did not want to move. In early 1875, James was taken ill with pneumonia. He was around 74 years old at the time. Elizabeth then went to look after him, and it was said that her husband and young child went with her to live at his house. It is worth noting that some newspaper reports suggest that Elizabeth and her husband had moved into his house immediately after her aunt's death. Old newspaper reports are a fantastic source of much detail in these old crime stories, but they do sometimes have very different information. So whether she had moved in straight away or after James was taken ill is not 100% clear. But it was said that she still kept her own home, which would suggest she intended to move back there at some point in time. Elizabeth was said to be a good nurse and took very good care of her uncle, and he did start to get a lot better. It was said he was even able to manage the stairs in the home, which he hadn't been able to do prior to Elizabeth looking after him. Even Dr Humphrey, who was looking after him, noticed how well he was doing and made a clear note of this when he visited his patient on the afternoon of March the 15th, 1875. It was on this visit that Elizabeth discussed some finer details about her uncle, who it seems was suffering quite badly with constipation. She asked the doctor if he could give her uncle something to help him. He offered her some tablets, however she asked if there was anything in powder form as she felt this would be easier for her uncle to take, and this is what the doctor prescribed, although he felt her uncle would be able to manage taking pills. It's safe to say that the doctor was then very alarmed to find that some short four hours later his patient was dead. It's clear that he believed that James should not have died when he had been recovering so well, so he reported the unexpected death to the coroner. Dr Humphrey also performed the post-mortem examination and an inquest was held at the Lord Nelson Inn in Gainford. Inquests were often held in public houses. It was a common thing for the time. I would assume this to be because public houses were often quite large so there would be enough room for everyone to attend and they were often close to the location of the crime. 
the Lord Nelson Inn was just a few yards away from Church Row. The results of the post-mortem had not shown any signs of disease to any of the major organs and despite James being in his 70s, it would seem he had been relatively fit and healthy. However, the doctor did find that the stomach was oddly red in colour and contained some unidentified liquid. The deputy coroner and Mr Thomas Dean ordered an analysis of the stomach contests and the inquest was adjourned. The stomach and contents were sent to Thomas Scattergood in Leeds for analysis. He was an expert in the field at the time and he found that the unidentified liquid contained strychnine and Prussian blue. Prussian blue was a colourant put into some poisons to alert people of the danger of using them. What he did not find, however, was any evidence of the powder that Dr Humphrey had prescribed for James Watson. It was said that strychnine would cause severe and painful spasms of the neck, back, limbs and also convulsions. Death would either be from asphyxiation caused by paralysis of the nerves that control breathing or possibly by exhaustion from the constant convulsions. It was said that people poisoned in this way would usually die within two to three hours after ingesting it as it was quickly absorbed into the body. The inquest was later resumed and Mr Scattergood spoke of his findings and of course it was then asked how James had this poison in his body and who had given it to him. It was now a murder inquiry. Gainford was a peaceful little village between Barnard Castle and Darlington and I am sure that the residents who lived there in 1875 never expected a murder to have taken place. Gainford is still a beautiful place today. Superintendent Thompson now became involved in the case and as part of his investigations he got a packet of Battles Vermin Killer from the village shop at Gainford. The shop is still there today but it is no longer used for the same purpose that it had in 1875. The Battles Vermin Killer was found to contain both strychnine and Prussian blue the substances that had been found in the stomach of James Watson. It was quickly decided that this had been used to poison James and that Elizabeth Pearson was the only person who could have given this to him and she was then arrested and charged with his murder. Elizabeth said she was innocent and when she was told that her home was to be searched and was asked if she had any battles vermin killer in her house, she replied by saying, I have never had such a thing in my life. The trial took place in early July in Durham. Elizabeth was said to have no counsel for her defence, but the judge requested that Mr Ridley would act on her behalf. Elizabeth was described as being of middle height, a little on the stout side, with dark hair and dark eyes. Elizabeth pleaded not guilty to the charge of murder. Jane Pearson, who was Elizabeth's mother-in-law, said that she knew both Elizabeth and James well and that early in March Elizabeth had asked her to get three pennies worth of moist pi mouse, mice poison sorry, for her, which she had done. Some short time later Elizabeth had asked her to get more, which again she had done. On the second occasion she noted that Elizabeth had wanted to keep a secret from all those living in the house. She claimed that this was because her husband was afraid of poison and she didn't want him to know that she had any. Jane claimed to have given the vermin killer to her in the presence of the lodger George Smith, but she believed that he would not have known this as Elizabeth quickly hid it away inside her clothing. John Corner, the grocer who ran the shop where the battle's vermin killer had been bought from, said he did indeed remember Jane Pearson coming to buy it and he said he had been concerned that she was buying it too frequently but that he had been told that the first lot had not killed that many mice and that more was needed. Robert Watson, the son of James, who lived at Barnard Castle, said he had last seen his father alive on Saturday, March the 13th. At the time, he said he had talked with his father about giving up the house and coming to live with him. This, he said, he had done in the presence of Elizabeth. His father had said he wished to stay in Gainford and Robert had told him that to do so he would need to sell off a lot of his furniture as he, Robert, 
was not able to pay the rent as well as giving his father money to live on. The rent for the house at the time was said to be £7 a year. His father had agreed to this and told him to return the following week to make arrangements for the sale. Robert said that as he was leaving, Elizabeth said to him, Robert, your father will never come downstairs alive again. When Robert asked why, Elizabeth had told him that this was what the doctor had told her. This seems to be completely different to the doctor's view that his patient was actually getting better. Robert then claimed that Elizabeth followed him down the stairs to tell him that his father had now changed his mind and would actually like to come and live with him. It would seem that Robert did not go back at the time to confirm this with his father. He then went on to say that his father died on Monday, March the 15th, and as he was in Gainford at the time, he went to his father's house but found it to be all locked up. The next day he returned and spoke to Elizabeth at her own home. He found that his father's house had been cleared of all furniture and it was now in Elizabeth's home. He asked her about the furniture and the money to bury his father. He claimed that Elizabeth told him, you said you would bury your father and now you can. He asked her how, which I am assuming to mean how could he afford to without his father's money or the furniture to sell, and he said that she just laughed at him. Robert then claimed to have spoken to John Pearson, who asked him if he would happy if he would be happy with the furniture that had been signed over to Elizabeth by his father, and he said that he would, but he claims Elizabeth said she would rather burn it then handed over and said it was not her husband's place to decide what happened to her possessions. He understood that some of the furniture had been the possession of Elizabeth's Aunt Jane, but the rest had belonged to his father, and on consulting a solicitor, he was able to get some of the furniture returned to him, which was enough to sell to pay for the burial of his father. And he also said that he had never known his father to have ever had any fits or convulsions in his lifetime. A lady by the name of Mary Brown gave brief evidence. She spoke only to say that James had been waited on hand and foot by Elizabeth and she felt that he could not have wanted for better. Anne Hall, who I believe was a neighbour, gave evidence of her last visit to see James. She claimed that the lodger George Smith had called her to come and see him late on the afternoon of March 15th and at the time that he was suffering badly, and he spoke to her only to say, Oh, Anne, please don't leave me. I fear I am going to have a trembling fit. Elizabeth was said to be in the room at the time, holding both of his hands as if to comfort him. Anne Hall then said she sent her daughter to get Dr Humphrey, but that she did not wait for his arrival and knew nothing more until finding out that James had died. The doctor's evidence was the same as that at the inquest, with only the addition that Thomas Scattergood had said, although the quantity of strychnine found in the stomach was quite small, this was not an indication of how much may have been taken, as it did absorb very quickly so only traces would remain. It was said that the lodger George Smith had given evidence at the inquest. Details of this I have not actually been able to find, but that since then he had vanished and the police had been unable to find him, so he was not able to give evidence at the trial. This, at the time, was not seen as strange, but I will come back to this a little later. The defence claimed that the prosecution, in his view, had not clearly proven that the strychnine had been the cause of death, or that it was clear that it was Elizabeth who had given this to James Watson, and he felt that if there was any doubt at all, then the benefit of it should be given to Elizabeth. The prosecution, however, felt that Elizabeth had given James the poison after hearing of his intention to sell the furniture, and she did not want this to happen as she wanted to keep and sell this herself, and also to keep any money that James had. She did not want the furniture sold or for the money to go to his son. Her motive, they said, was clearly money. The jury retired for around one hour before returning with the verdict of guilty of murder against Elizabeth Pearson. The judge then passed sentence of death by hanging and that her remains would be buried within the grounds of Durham Prison. 
It was said that during the trial and during the passing of the sentence that Elizabeth said nothing and showed no emotion at all. She was described as being of a very cool and calm appearance. However, it was said that once removed from the dock, she wept bitterly before being taken back to Durham Prison to await her fate. As was the normal practice, a petition was started to appeal for a reprieve of the death penalty for Elizabeth. This was, as in most cases, rejected. Elizabeth then tried to claim that she was pregnant, although this would only delay the execution, not commute it, but it was quickly proven that she was not pregnant and the execution date was set for August 2nd, 1875. Elizabeth was visited in prison by her husband and daughter. She was also visited by her mother. It was said in some newspaper reports that Elizabeth's mother was upset, not just at the thought of the loss of her daughter, but also because some two years prior to this, her son had been killed in almost the same area where her daughter was to be executed. He had actually fallen accidentally into the river and drowned. She found visiting her daughter a very hard thing to do. Elizabeth's husband was also very upset after the last visit, but Elizabeth was said to be cool and calm and showing no emotion, just as she had done at her trial. The Reverend J.C. Law had visited her constantly, but it was said that other than saying to anyone who would listen that she was innocent, his visits had done nothing to change her attitude and it was claimed that she had gained no sympathy from any of those assigned to look after her. On the morning of the execution, Elizabeth was awoken at 6am. There were no details given as to whether she had slept well or had a peaceful night. She was then attended by the Reverend Law. Some reports suggest that breakfast of lamb chop, bread, butter and tea was given, but that Elizabeth only had tea. She was then left with the Reverend Law until the execution hour arrived. It is at this point that I will mention that this was to be a triple execution. Also to be hanged that day with Elizabeth were two men by the names of William McHugh and Michael Gillingham. All three would be hanged at exactly the same time and it was said that this was the last occasion in England where three prisoners would all be executed at the same time for unrelated crimes. The executioner was William Marwood. Marwood was the man known for using the new measured drop method for hangings, as this was said to be a more humane way to hang those convicted, as the neck would be broken and the death would be almost instant, whereas the previous method often left those hanging to die slowly. It seems that this was done more for the sake of those who had to witness the event than for the prisoners as many saw no need to re re reduce the suffering of the guilty. In 1875, the measured drop was still a very new method. It had been devised by surgeons in Ireland and introduced into the UK by the said William Marwood. Just before 8am, Elizabeth was pinioned, her arms were tied at the wrists and she was led with her two fellow prisoners to where the gallows had been erected. Some reports state that she walked firmly forwards with again no signs of emotion, but other reports suggest that she cried from leaving her cell until she was standing on the drop. Just after 8am, all three were positioned on the scaffold and the sign was then given to remove the bolt. Elizabeth's death was said to be instantaneous. A small crowd of around 300 to 400 people had gathered outside. They would see nothing, but some said they felt that they heard the trap door open just after 8am. And almost immediately after this, the black flag was flown and a bell was sounded to signal the fact that the punishment had been carried out. As was usual in these cases, the body would be left for one hour before being taken down and placed into a plain a black coffin. Some reports said that the face of Elizabeth was uncovered and that she looked peaceful. I believe this was reported as prior to the measured drops, deaths had been quite gruesome and prisoners often looked quite badly distorted when seen by reporters after the hanging had taken place. Elizabeth was buried in the grounds of Durham Prison in a location close to that of Mary Ann Cotton, 
who had been executed in 1873. Elizabeth had paid with her life for what seemed to be the desire to own her uncle's furniture and to take what little money he had, but was she really guilty of the crime she was hanged for? It would seem that some years later it was suggested that she had not been the one to poison James Watson. It was thought the real culprit may have been George Smith, the man who had vanished from Gainford just after the inquest. People thought it odd that he had left so suddenly, and why had he left, if not because he was guilty? But what motive did he have? They did not seem to have a motive for him, or any real evidence against him. So what do you think? Was Elizabeth guilty, or was it George Smith? I have to say that my own personal thoughts are, yes, Elizabeth was guilty. After hearing about her clearing the house of furniture as soon as James had died, and refusing to help with funeral costs, her behaviour towards James' son and her cold and calm appearance at the trial all make me feel that she was not innocent and perhaps helping her uncle to recover from his illness made her think that no one would then suspect her if he later died. Of course, these are just my own thoughts and yours may be very different. John Pierce and her widow went on to remarry and had several more children and remained in the Gainford area. He was still alive and well in 1911. Her only confirmed daughter remained in the area for some time too, so it seems that they were not treated any differently because of Elizabeth's crime. I hope you have found this sad and tragic story interesting, and if you have enjoyed it, please do give it a thumbs up. And please do consider subscribing to the channel channel if you'd like to hear more stories like this one. Thank you all very much for watching and I hope to see you all again very soon.